Hello maths fans, welcome to a special video with a super special guest. Joining us today we have Dr Trevor Bassett, all the way from the University of Victoria in Western Canada. You may also recognise him from his excellent YouTube channel, Dr Trevor Bassett, which you should totally go and check out <laughs> if you haven't already. So Trevor, today I am planning to teach you a little bit of fluid mechanics. Excellent, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> Okay, good. I mean, it, it's kind of, it's apparently become my thing as the fluids guy. So I felt when we decided to do this little bit of uh, <laughs> collaboration between us, I felt like I had to continue my progression in teaching the world fluid mechanics. So of course, I previously taught a little bit about the method of images to Grant from 3 Blue 1 Brown. So this is in some sense a continuation, but I am going to go over all of the key things you need. Uh, but you know, that, that would be a good primer video uh, for anyone watching. So the problem we're going to look at today uh, is one of vortex motion. And there's a particular problem which I'm going to set up at the start and then we're going to kind of build up the tools we need to be able to solve and answer the question. All right, so the good. idea is if I were to have a quadrant like so, so let's say it is the positive quadrant and I have some walls here. And this is filled with fluid. Okay. And then you're going to have a vortex at this point. Uh, and it's going to rotate anti-clockwise with some known amount of vorticity or mm. circulation. And what we want to know is how does this vortex move from this setup? So it's kind of starting here. It's obviously got a couple of walls that it can't really move through, but we mm -hmm. want to know what is the path that it's going to take as it moves through that fluid. Right, right. And I think the answer is quite beautiful, so hopefully you'll also enjoy where we go with this and what we get to. Okay, um, okay. And it does involve some pretty interesting maths, which again, I picked this topic because I, I hope, obviously having watched a lot of your content, I hope it's gonna overlap with some of the interesting things that, that you sort of enjoy yourself. So our starting point, as with the method of images, is we need to look at what's called 2D potential flow. Mm. So it's a simplified version of the real world, obviously, as most of these things are in fluids. Uh, so we're working in 2D, and we're going to assume that our fluid is incompressible. So this, for example, would be something like water. If you compress a meter cube of water, it will shrink a little bit at extremely high pressures, but not very much. It's right, generally right. not going to be compressible. Uh, right, whereas a gas the, would behave completely differently. Of course, yes, that would be compressible fluid. Yes, exactly. So the incompressibility equation tells us that the divergence of the velocity field has to be equal to zero. Right, okay. I remember so this at least from my vector be... calculus. Perfect. <laughs> Back in the day. So you... <laughs> U here will be our 2D velocity, so of course U, just to really spell it out, will be a U, V. Two components, X component, Y component of our velocity, and we're saying here the divergence is zero. Right, so the U here would be, if you were to draw an arrow somewhere on your little plot, the arrow would be given by this particular vector U and would indicate where is the fluid moving at that particular spot. Exactly, so U along the bottom, V at the top, total velocity like that. Yeah, Beautiful. exactly. And it's also going to be irritational. Now this, the equation for an irritational fluid is the curl or the vector product of the velocity is also zero. This is the setup, the situation. Now, what we can do with this second point, so if we label them one, two, is because the curl of u is zero, sort of racking your brains back to vector calculus. We've got, we've got div, we've got curl, and the other one, of course, is grad. Right. Now, do you happen to remember, if you apply two of them in a certain order, you will always get zero. Oh, right, yes. Situations. A lot of the ways you permute them are zero, but some of them don't tell you anything. Is that right? Yes, yes. Right, so, so I'll one forget which, ones which, that... ones, which ones permute, but that, that is generally a, a true thing I remember. <laughs> so um, what you can conclude from the fact that the curl of u is zero 
is you can actually say if u is equal to a gradient of some potential, mm -hmm. called potential flow, some potential phi, then when you take the curl of a gradient, it's automatically zero. Right. Because curl of grad is always zero. Right, right. So that's going to be what we call our um, velocity um, potential. So this is our potential phi. And that just follows precisely because if u has this form, automatically it's irrotational. And it does go the other way. You have to have some other extra conditions, but for our purposes, <laughs> Curl grad is zero. Hopefully that's enough to sort of satisfy. <laughs> no, that's um, good. The, you know, the longtime physicist of me from my undergrad, uh, who doesn't know fluid mechanics, but knows a little bit about fields, would think about this from, say, the gravitational field. We would call it a conservative uh -huh. field, which would mean it could be written as the gradient of a potential function and would have a curl of that thing being equal to zero as well. Absolutely, yes. Um, now, the other one, we can also use equation one to give us something. So if u is something else, then when we take the divergence of it, we will get zero. And it turns out that here, if you take u to be equal to the curl of a potential phi in the third unit vector direction. So you can double check this. If u is equal to this curl, then when you take the divergence of u, you will always get zero. Now, the other thing we can get from this, and this is hopefully, I think, the bit you're going to like, because uh, it links to a completely different area of maths, and it's lovely, is the, we, so we have these two equations for u, but of course, u is just our velocity vector. So we know that u, the vector, is just u in the i direction, the horizontal velocity, plus the vertical velocity. So given we know that, and given we know these two things, from, I guess, this top equation, we can say that, well, what can we say about, let's say, scalar u, based on this top equation here? Right, well, the, the gradient of phi here is going to be a vector. It's going to have two different components. And so mm -hmm. the two different components are the partial derivatives respect to x and y, respectively. So I guess we're saying that the little u, the, no, the scalar u that you have there would be the partial with respect to f, and v would be the partial with respect to y. Is, is that where we're going? Perfect. Yes, exactly. So u is phi x, and v is phi y. Now, based on the second one, we have another equation for u. So if we compute this as a cross product, you get phi y minus psi x zero. If you were to compute that vector product. Right. So right. again, this would be, this vector, of course, is 0, 0, psi. It, Take exactly. a cross product, do your determinant in the usual way, and it comes out like this. Okay, yeah. So what this is telling us is this is obviously u, and this is v. So putting them over here, we've got d phi by dx is equal to d psi by dy, and d phi by dy is equal to minus x. Have you Wonderful. ever seen those equations before? Well, I guess, are they sort of reminiscent of a cauchy riemann type of thing? It's exactly cauchy riemann They are the cauchy riemann equations. So you've got, uh, you know, an x derivative equal to a y derivative, and then a y derivative equal to minus an x derivative of the second thing. Right. Well, so that's very so interesting. In I think of cauchy riemann as this part of what we're talking about—a complex function being. Maybe we're going to go this direction and being analytic, and it's sort of this this purely sort of analytic property that falls out with no connection to physics at that time. But here you've yeah. written it so nicely, but but deeply representing this connection to fluid mechanics. That's very interesting. So what we've got are the cauchy riemann equations. Now, if you were to think about the cauchy riemann equations, or you were to describe them to me, you've just said yourself you're talking about a, a holomorphic function. Yep. infinitely differentiable and, and, and whatnot in the complex plane. Now, what are the two bits that you take the derivatives of in the cauchy riemann equations? Um, well, we're talking about the real component and the imaginary component of our complex function. Is this, is this what you're referring to? Yes, exactly. So what we do, and I'm going to have to make a little bit of extra space. So what we're going to do here to get our potentials 
is use that exact same concept. And of course, there is some more underlying uh, theory that allows us to make this jump, but hopefully I've convinced you enough. So you're saying that for the cauchy riemann or the CR equations, you would say, here's a function, let's call it w of z, complex variable. You have the real part, which I'm going to call phi, plus i times psi. So the real part would be phi, and psi would be the imaginary part. And then this is therefore a holomorphic function precisely because it satisfies the equations in this box. Delightful. And again, this is what's happening. So this function here is exactly the complex potential for a fluid. I so got given, it. Wonderful. Right. So it's sort of the given, two. So was there a name to the to the? Oh no, I see. You wrote it down. The stream function. Okay. So there's what I normally thought of was yep. the potential, and you've got this other one. But together, the two of them can be thought of as the complex potential. Okay, I'm with you. Yes. This is the complex potential. So because this is a holomorphic function satisfying the cauchy riemann equations. This now means that if we were to take the complex derivative, dw by dz, now that means we can take this derivative in any direction hmm. for a holomorphic function. So for example, we can just do um, d by dx of w, which is phi plus i. And we know that has to give us dw by dz, just like if I did d by dy or something else. It has to be right. And this is it, it's required that this function satisfies cauchy riemann and thus is holomorphic for this property to be true. But given that assumption, then we can sort of simplify. I guess we're really we're just simplifying our lives here because we're saying we're gonna we want to take a to respect to x. That's gonna be easier for us to do. Yes, exactly. So um, the first term, of course, gives us phi by dx, and then we get plus i. Now, I have rubbed these off the board, but do you remember what velocity component d phi by dx had to be? Oh, uh, well, u, I believe. Little scalar u, is it that right? It was, yes. So that's u. And then d psi by dx? No, one second. Was that, I, have, do we have a sign issue? Is it negative v, or am I, or am I remembering it incorrectly? It is, yes, very good. It's negative, yeah, there's a swap. Yeah, I wanted to say v so, first, but I think you're right. There was a negative in our derivation, okay. So what we've got is that we have the complex potential is given by the velocity uh, potential plus i times the stream function. And then if we take do dw by dz of this thing, we get u minus iv. Got so it. now the real part of this derivative gives us our horizontal velocity, and the imaginary part gives us the negative of the vertical mm. velocity. So Got suddenly, it. Okay. If we can write this down, this w, if we know this for a particular fluid like setup, we actually just differentiate and suddenly we know the velocity field. Delightful. So it contains all of this really valuable information for trying to understand what's happening. Right. So we figured out the complex potential and how it relates to the Cauchy Riemann and then it gives us this nice result involving velocity. So if I were to now consider the uh, setup that we have. So we have these walls, and we're going to have a vortex up here with circulation equal to gamma in the anti-clockwise direction. OK. And I'm going to say that this is centered at z equals c. A c is some complex number. Good. Now, we know the potential for this. We can compute this by deriving the, the various stream function velocity potential, but I'll just give you this, I'm feeling nice. So we know that for a single vortex, a single vortex has a complex potential which is given by minus i gamma over two pi times the log of z minus c. All right. So the two pi is there for scaling, uh, the idea is this gamma is just a constant, and the sort of the idea is if you were to integrate around a circle around this point, the total amount of circulation, as we call it, mm. would be equal to gamma. So gamma is like the strength of the vorticity, how much it's actually spinning. I see. Okay, right. And then we have this pole effectively at z equal to c, 
which is yes. However, you want to describe sort of an infinite potential to to, to spin around in some sense. Yes. So this is our complex potential. Now, this is the complex potential for the vortex here with no walls. So now we need to use the method of images. I gotcha, okay. So the idea, hopefully you remember, but just to remind, the idea is we can't really, instead of adding in the walls, what we want to do is add like a reflection of a vortex that's gonna push right. in the exact opposite direction. And then also on this side and also down here to kind of so I suppose the idea here that. is that if when I think to the to the video that you did with Grant, all of the poles were sort of symmetrically located, but they were all exactly the same because everything was a source. But here we have to deal with the fact that yes. it's spinning in some sense. So yes. I guess we're going to want to have them symmetrically located, but also alternating the clockwise versus counterclockwise. Is, is that right? Yes. So, so let's start with the one down here. So what, where will this one be located? If this is at C? Right, so uh, what we really want to be changing is just the imaginary part, so the real part's the same. So thus, if we take the yep. conjugate of C, then we should be at the right spot. Is that right? Perfect, yes. So this one's now at C bar. Um, so we're going to have a term here, which we'll worry about the sign in a moment. Um, so we have the same term, and then in here, it's now Z minus C bar. Gotcha. Now, which way do you think this one will need to spin? Right, to okay, so, so is it a convention that your original minus sign was to reflect the fact that it was a counterclockwise rotation? Yes. Right, so, so I am going to claim it's positive in that case to represent yes. a clockwise rotation. Good, so this has circulation minus gamma, so then this becomes a plus. So we've replaced this gamma from here with a minus gamma, so it changes the sign. Right. So I don't know if this is the right yeah. way to think about it, but I'm sort of imagining that if I was on the x-axis here and try to think, well, the top one would sort of be giving a downwards pressure, and the bottom one would yeah. give an upwards pressure, and that would sort Perfect. of kind of like that's flow exactly, into each other. And... That's why it works. This is why the method of images is, I think, very intuitive, because you just think, right, this is kind of pushing me down, so this yeah, thing right. has to push me back up. And then yeah, yeah, right, though, right. You know, because it's the exact same distance away, it's as though the wall was there, which is right. obviously what we're trying to solve for. Right, Good. okay, very cool. Now, um, what about this one? So, same story here, but we're going to be, I guess, uh, wanting to add the value of C instead, of subtract our value of C. Uh, yes, so this one will be located at Z is equal, uh, this is minus C bar, I believe. Oh, min minus C bar, I apologize, yeah, right. Well, it's going to be minus C bar for that one. Um, so then we've got I gamma over 2 pi log, and then, as you say, now it's a plus C bar. Yep. Um, and the circulation? Okay, so uh, I want this one to be a positive as well, I believe. Yes, good, yeah. Because that one's kind of pushing you down, so this one has to push you also down. Yes, because that one's, yeah, it's pushing you towards the wall, isn't it? That one's pushing you towards the wall, that one's pushing back. That's the way Right, right, yeah, yeah, if you, uh, yeah, this way, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, minus gamma, right, so that's also a plus. And then what's gonna be our last term? So I guess I'm gonna think of this one as a minus, as a, as another minus, because it's re reflecting the two ones that are plus on both sides, there's gotta be another minus sign. Uh, and then what is it? We're going to have log of Z plus C, I think. Perfect, yeah. Uh, and so it's going to be gamma as well, isn't it? So that one doesn't change. That one's the same. So then it's going to be minus I gamma 2 pi log of Z plus C. Okay, so we have a rather complicated <laughs> complex potential. Now, what we want to use for vortex motion going to be our final step is we have something called Helmholtz principle named after the mathematician that studied this which says that a vortex moves um, with the velocity the velocity um, field G 
due to everything except itself. So this is kind of the classic case of borrowing from physics, I would say here. <laughs> We're saying, Mr. Helmholtz has discovered this principle <laughs> based on his analysis of vortices, and now we want to use this to figure out what's our velocity field, so then we can get the motion and the path of our vortex in this particular quadrant. Okay. So, what is the first thing we're going to have to do before we can apply this? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so we have our complex potential. Yeah. And we want to know the velocity field. So how did we, we figured out how to turn the potential into the velocity component. Right, we, we differentiate and identify the, the u and the v components, okay. Right, so that's going to be our next step. Gotcha. So if we kinda, I'll do it here and then we'll write each term one by one. So what's gonna happen when I differentiate? Well, we're gonna have a, a one over z minus c appearing, I suppose, in each, and, and so on for the other terms. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, it's very nice. So what we can do then is, um, let's try and write it like this. So this is going to be a minus 1 over z minus c. Uh, and, and do point out if I do something wrong here. Yeah, no, you're, you're good. <laughs> okay, so that's correct. And then this one, we've got the same factor with a plus, so then it becomes plus 1 over z minus c bar. Then we've got plus 1 over z plus c bar. And then I hope minus 1 over z plus c. Okay, so I hope that is going to now be dw by dz, which of course is equal to u minus iv. Now, so this is the general velocity field mm -hmm. for this whole problem. But we have to now apply Helmholtz principle. So which term do we ignore? Okay, so the principle is the vortex moves with the velocity field due to everything except itself. But you're, you're implying that this means we get to ignore some terms. Yes, because at the moment we've got like four terms. Each sort of bit of this velocity has come from one of our four so, uh, oh, I understand. So what you're su I, I see. So you're saying that we basically, we, we can ignore the first of the term, the one that was the actual field, but the three that are, so the images yes. are the ones that have to remain. Ah, I see. Okay. Exactly. So that's why, that's where Helmholtz principle really helps us out. Because what we want to do is we want to know if the, so it's starting at this position z equals c. So we actually ah. want to evaluate the velocity at z equals c. Right, right. And of course, you mentioned yourself, we can't do that here because it's a pole. It goes to infinity. Ah, uh, so but it's not Helmholtz for any of the other values at, at specifically C. Ah, right. So this principle is actually incredibly important here. Yes, absolutely. So what we're going to do is now evaluate this at z equals C. Evaluate this at z equals C. And then we can now evaluate the right-hand side. So this becomes C. This becomes C. And this becomes C. Right, now we've got a couple of uh, conjugates and things being added together. So what do I get when I do the complex number C minus its conjugate? Right, so the, the conjugate changes the sign on the complex part. So when you have the difference, the reals are going to be subtracted away. So you'll have like minus twice the imaginary part on the bottom for the, for the first, first non-trivial term. Uh, Is that right? Yes, I... Uh, it will be the positive one, though, of the imaginary part, won't it? Um, First. Uh, minus the negative. Say, yes, correct. Yes, positive. If we say yep. c is x plus i y, then c bar is x minus i y. And so we're subtracting c, c bar, c hence positive. Yeah, okay. So we've got there a 1 over 2 i y. Uh, c plus c bar. That's just going to be 2x on the bottom, then? Yep. And then, of course, c plus c um, is this 1 over 2x plus i y, like so. What are we going to need to do next, remembering what we're trying to get? Right, so our, our final goal will be to say what the u and the v are. 
Yes, so exactly. I think we could break up this expression that we have into the terms that are real and the terms that are imaginary, recognizing there's a bunch of eyes floating around, so we'll have to put, combine them all together. We'll be left with the real part and an imaginary part, and we can identify those with, I guess, the U and the V. Perfect. That's exactly what we're going to do. So we've done as you suggested, and we've tidied this up into the real part plus I times the imaginary part. Right. Now, the final thing we have to just think about is how this relates to C specifically. Okay. So in the sense that we've said that C was equal to x plus i, y, and that's what x and y represent here, mm -hmm. our general position in the complex plane. So when we have u minus i, v, so the u, velo the u is our horizontal velocity. So what's u in terms of uh, x as a time derivative? Um, are you referring to just being the first term of your expression here? Yes, so the real part here. So u has to be dx by dt. Sort of oh, oh I see where you're going you, with what this. Does you, what does you represent? Yeah, you're just saying, how do we actually interpret this thing? Change. Exactly, we just have to be, because at the moment we've got kind of u's and v's and x's and y's, and we need to get something, what we're aiming for is something purely in terms of x and y, so that we can plot a graph that will show the path of our vortex. I understand. So you'll have x as a function of t and y as a function of t and derivatives of these respect exactly. to t, and then that will be yes. how your particles or your flow moves around, I suppose. Okay, I'm with you. So, you'll, so we can say that u is dx by dt. And then what we've, of course, got here then is now minus dy by dt. Right. Minus that times i because of that minus sign. So this really is d, so you can also think of this as dc bar by dt. Mm. So it, it's, it's, this, is, this is the common mistake I see all my students make. So oh, I just okay. wanted to <laughs> clarify, because you think, oh, look, I've evaluated it at z equals c, so this is now, you know, dc by dt c equals this. To, yeah. yeah, so you just have to be a little bit careful because of that, that switch in the sign that we had there. Right. So right. now we can take the real part, this is equal to dx by dt, is sort of one equation involving mm -hmm. x, y, and time, mm -hmm. where x and y are functions of time. And then here, we take the imaginary part, and we can say this is now equal to minus dy by dt by taking imaginary parts. Right. Now... We want to get an equation just in terms of y and x, so we need to eliminate t. Okay. Any ideas how we might do that? All right, so we have, I guess, two different parametric equations here. I mean, I guess we're going to be doing some sort of integration of these on both sides to eliminate the t. Is, is that what you're thinking? Well, we, we certainly could. Um, you could try and integrate, but if I were, for example... Oh, oh never mind. I think I've got t. a better idea. We, could, we can take some sort of ratio of these, for example, dx dt yes. divided by dy dt, this idea. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And then that so will turn to a say, dx dy or a dy dx, whichever direction you're trying to suggest. Yeah, so if we do dy by dt over dx by dt... I guess I should be able to answer that quickly. This is a sort of a standard calculus topic I would teach <laughs> my students. <laughs> I think it's easy to know if you're teaching like parametric equations or yeah, yeah, differential yeah, right, equations. Okay. It's easy, but when you're sort of, you know, going from physics yeah, yeah. to complex <laughs> analysis, to, that's why I was hoping. I'm, I, I think you're enjoying this. That's why I thought it was no, a nice this problem. Lovely, there's just so many different things that come together. In, in, it's, in just you're you're absolutely right. Yeah, you've got the kind of the physical and then the complex analysis and then these different sort of just techniques, even if it's just taking a complex derivative, all these things. Yeah, very nice. So we can okay. say, therefore, dy by dx, and then if we do, remembering the minus, that one divided by that one, you're going to get, um, so we're going to get a y squared over an x, and then this one gives us a y on the top over an x squared, so it's going to look like, I think, minus y cubed over x cubed. Yeah. Just double check, you're happy I've done that right. <laughs> I think that's what we get. So, we've almost done it now. Because this is now a um, separable Very nice. equation that we can solve. So again, mm -hmm. another technique comes into play. That's right. <laughs> so um, we can do, what are we going to do? We're going to take the y across and get the integral of minus 1 over 
y cubed dy is going to be equal to the integral of 1 over x cubed dx. And then if we integrate up and tidy up all of those constants, what we're going to finally end up with is 1 over y squared plus 1 over x squared equals c constant. Wonderful. So there, there might be some twos and threes floating around, but you can tidy them all up because they're common to both terms. I see, and I'm just uh, just I'm noting that of course these things aren't defined at the origin, but it sort of I guess makes sense that you have these these infinities at the origin, sort of like it has to do a sharp corner to to respect the wall there. So it actually it makes sense. So the final step, we have an explicit equation for the motion of our vortex, and so now we just have to draw it. Right. Okay. Plotting this function, Trevor, how are we going to do that? Well, if, if you put your little dot of C there, because that's, that's going to occur at some spot here. Yep, let's suppose it's there. Okay. So, I think what I would try to do was, uh, I can't plug in 0 or 1, or I can't plug in 0 to either x or y, but I might try something just to make it simple, to, like plugging in something like x equal to 1. And say, along yep. x equal to 1, you're going to have a, a vertical, or perhaps even better, x equal to c. <laughs> that would be a fun one. No, the real part. Oh, let's do 1. And the point being is, along that line, I want to try to figure out, well, what are all the y's values going to look along that line? And I'll try to put it together for a few different lines. Does that sort of make sense as an approach? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, so, of course, the, I think the key thing to bear in mind is we, we don't actually care what this value is. No. We, it's just, we just know it's fixed. That's, that's right. Yeah, so, so I, I guess um, the point is if, if, you, if you set x to be a constant, which means you're trying to figure out what happens along a vertical line here, you get 1 over y squared is equal to some constant. It's the constant yes. you've written minus 1 over whatever you plug in there. And so you sort of get a 1 over y squared behavior. And we know sort of what 1 over y squared looks like. It has that kind of behavior. Yes. So it's kind of something like this. Because you have the same behavior, because of course it's symmetric in x and y. So very mm -hmm. similar to mm -hmm. what you were showing, I think, mm -hmm. with your hands. Okay. Yep. So whatever this value may be, if you were to say it was 1, just to make mm -hmm. things easier, then you can kind of figure out that as x is tending towards 0, y has to go really big as x goes small. And similarly, sure. as x goes really big, y has to go really small. Sure, yeah, okay. So what you see is that your vortex confined to this quadrant, confined to this corner, which is rotating anti-clockwise with vorticity gamma, it actually moves down, down along here, turns some distance from the corner, and then continues to prop up, propagate like so. So it kind of, as you said yourself, it can't do the right-angled corner, so it kind of comes in and just nicely, smoothly transitions and bends. Right, you can sort of, the more you get into the corner, the more it would look like that right angle, I guess. Yes, yeah, and, and if you were to sort of, if you started closer, it would look even more like that. That's right. And it would begin in the sort of limit of being mm -hmm. on the wall, it would mm -hmm. of course follow the right angle. Okay. And that's it. We figured out how a vortex <laughs> with uh, circulation gamma behaves in a quadrant. That's very cool. So That's very cool. Complete roller coaster of. Because um, <laughs> I, I wonder, did you think this is sort of intuitive? Was this your initial thought about how it might? Yeah. Move, so or did you I guess not? when I was, if I was just looking at the plot that you have on your left board here, ignoring the the images that we brought out, and just trying to think about what would happen, yeah. it it sort of does make sense because when you've got the, yes, yeah, right, a counterclockwise spin, it starts sending yeah. the flow sort of towards the, the y-axis, but there's nowhere for it to go, so it has to spike up, if that makes sense. Yeah, yes. Has to, yeah, in that sense, spike up and then... And, and in the other spike. side, when it goes down, you're like, okay, if it's rotating and now it's sending it sort of down and off to the right, well, there's lots of room for it to sort of disperse out there. There's not the restriction as, as much, given how you the where you've drawn your, your dot in this particular case. So I, I think it seems reasonable to me. Briefly recap, we did... Uh, what did we do? We did stream functions and velocity potentials, talking yep. about grad div and curl. Mm -hmm. We then looked at the, the Cauchy-Riemann equations mm -hmm. and the complex potential. Um, we then used that to talk about holomorphic functions, taking the derivative in any direction to figure out the velocity field. Then we applied Helmholtz principle to the potential for... That was the, that was the one that I was most found this. or didn't, wouldn't have come up with. That's, I thought that the Helmholtz principle was really interesting. Are we able to just eliminate an entire term 
because of sort yeah. of this physics principle that, that we were able to cite. That's really cool. Exactly. That, that's what, as I said at the time, that's kind of where, as a mathematician, you have to borrow from like physicists saying, well, this is what happens. So yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, that, there's a suspension of disbelief there a little bit, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then finally, we just had to do some playing around with those parametric equations, pair of, or coupled pair of differential equations to then solve. And we Lightful. get this lovely... Um, Sort of curved. That's curved. that's really cool, Tom. I think I'm gonna have to, to learn a little bit more about fluid mechanics now. You you spark you spark <laughs> yeah, the interest. So I hope you've enjoyed learning some fluids uh, today, Trevor. I've certainly enjoyed Absolutely. teaching you. Obviously, model student as I expected. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, um, anyone who hasn't checked out uh, Trevor's channel, Dr. Trevor Bassett. Strongly recommend it. It's awesome. There's all kinds of like full oh, courses you. of this kind of calculus stuff that we've been talking about. Um, so if you want to brush up on any of your techniques or any of the things we've seen here, there's definitely plenty of content over there. So again, thank you very much, um, Trevor. Thank you everyone as always for watching. Um, please do remember to subscribe to the channel if you've enjoyed the video uh, and I'll see you all very soon.